So far, the edit tools we've seen have changed our meshes destructively. This means if we want to make any alterations, we'll have to undo some steps or start over. Modifiers are not only powerful generators of iterative design, they're also a way which allow us to model non-destructively. In fact, some of the modifiers we're about to look at are direct analogs of edit tools we've already seen. I'm going to duplicate this cube here with Shift D as I want a separate object with its own unique mesh data. I'll select this one, I'll toggle into edit mode, and I'll use my bevel tool and create a simple chamfer all around this cube. I'll commit it, then toggle back into object mode. Now I'll select this cube. But instead of going into edit mode, I'm going to go over to its properties editor, click on the modifiers tab, that's this one with the wrench icon, and I'll click on add modifier. A categorized dropdown appears. I'll hover over generate and select bevel. This cube now has a bevel on it as well. The modifier has parameters that look very familiar if you recall the last action window when we use the bevel modifier. The difference here is that we haven't actually transformed this second cube. We can select both cubes in object mode and toggle into edit mode, and we'll see the difference. The cube with the bevel modifier still has the same topology, whereas the beveled cube has all this extra geometry. Let's go back into object mode and take a look at the outliner. If we reveal the data blocks for each of these cubes, under this one, we have our data block, but we also have this modifier. Inside that, we can see the modifier is called bevel. I'll select the cube with the modifier, toggle into edit mode, and let's adjust some parameters. I can change its profile to custom and choose a fairly complex preset like this cornice molding. Obviously nothing has happened because the segment count is still one. So let's increase that until we begin to see the custom profile show up. Notice that all this time, the cube's original geometry has remained unchanged. Okay, that's great. But what if we needed that modifier to just affect a single edge? That's where the limit method comes into play. So far, it is set to angle. This is simply a threshold below which the modifier will not be added. To demonstrate, I'll set this to something quite high, but not 90, let's say 75. And then in edit mode, I'll display my edge angles overlay so we can see all of the angles between edges here. I'll select this edge here, hit G to grab, X to constrain it, and move this edge back until it reaches an angle below 75. Now this edge has no longer got a bevel on it. Everything else does because it's above 75 degrees. However, the most popular method to do this is using weight. I'll set the limit method to that now. No edge is beveled because by default, all of the edge weights are currently zero. I will select a single edge, toggle into my edge menu with Control E and select edge bevel weight. Now I can move my mouse back and forth. And if you pay attention to the region in the top left here, you can see the number float between zero and one one being the highest, and this edge shows a bevel. There is a simpler way to see this, but it comes in very useful, and that is by viewing our side panel. So far, we've had this hidden. I'll show it now by hitting the hotkey N. You can also go to the View menu and tick this box. The top tab is labeled Item, and here we can see some properties for our selection. Under Edge Data, we can see bevel weight. What's amazing about this method is that we can now select a different edge and set its weight to a different amount, and the bevel will be scaled accordingly. Modifiers can also be previewed in a number of modes. Next to the name here, which is editable by the way, we have a few icons. One is for viewing it when we're in edit mode, the other for when we're in real time, and the other one to show up when it renders. We can, for example, only want to see the modifier in object mode, so we can disable the edit mode button. Now when we toggle into edit mode, 
we only see the original geometry. Finally, modifiers can be applied, and when this happens, the cube's geometry is altered destructively. But modifiers aren't limited to non-destructive modeling. Let's now look briefly at a couple of modifiers which can create some really cool effects, and see what happens when we alter their position in the modifier stack. I'm going to delete these cubes, and I'm going to add a sphere. I'll also set it to smooth. I'll now add a wave modifier from the deform section. If we hit the spacebar, this will generate an animated wave over the entire project. I'll go back to frame one, and I'll add an array modifier from the generate section. The array has plenty of parameters, and I'll take you through a couple as we adjust the settings. Right now, we have an array count of two, and it is set to relative offset with a factor of one for X. What this means is that we have two objects sitting apart exactly the distance that the sphere is wide in its X axis. If I increase this factor, the spheres move apart a little. And if I increase the count, we can create more instances of this sphere. Now when I hit play, all the spheres will oscillate exactly the same. But what happens if we place this array modifier above the wave? We can do this by clicking and dragging on this handle here and dragging the array modifier to the top of the stack, or by using the drop down menu and we can move the modifier to the top or the bottom. If we play this again, the wave behaves a little differently. The spheres aren't oscillating like copies, but rather the wave is moving out from the original sphere's point of origin. The array is the first modifier to affect the sphere, then the wave is added. Let's keep working on this example to demonstrate how we can quickly generate something pretty cool with just a few modifiers. I'm going to add an empty object to use as a pivot. So I'll hit Shift A, Empty, and I'll just use a plain axis type. I'm going to increase its radius a little so that it pokes out from our original sphere and we won't have to toggle into X-ray mode to select it. I'll move this across a little in the X-axis also. Now when I select my sphere and go under the Array Modifier, I'll untick Relative Offset and tick Object Offset. We can either type the name of the object here, or we can click on this icon and select from a drop-down. Or the fastest and most intuitive way that I like to use is with this eyedropper. I'll click on the eyedropper, move my cursor over to the empty, the name should pop up, and I'll left click to select it. Immediately, the second instance of the sphere jumps to the position of the empty. Now I'll select the empty and scale it down a little. Notice how each instance scales proportionately. If I scale this down to, say, 0.8 or 80%, then we know that the second instance of the sphere will be 80% of the original sphere's size. The third will be 80% of the second sphere's, and so on. We can also rotate this empty. Let's rotate it 30 degrees along the z-axis. This second sphere has rotated 30 degrees, and each sphere in the array rotates 30 degrees from the point of origin of the instance that precedes it. You can see how pivot points play a big role even when it comes to cool stuff like modifiers. I can toggle into edit mode for the sphere and work on some of its mesh data. For example, I'll move the sphere up so that its pivot is around its base. Now all the spheres scale from that pivot point, so they appear to be sitting all on one surface. OK, so now I'd like to pin my wave modifier to the last bit in Q. I'll now add a subdivision surface modifier so that we can get an even smoother wave on the spheres. It will automatically drop in after the array modifier, but before the wave. I'm going to send this one to the top of the stack because I would like the sphere to first be subdivided, then the array to instance the sphere before the wave takes effect. Now when I play the animation, 
each sphere oscillates from the center of the original sphere, and we can even control the fall off, even the start position, while this is playing in the wave modifier. Now, if you want to get an in depth look at all the main modifiers available, you should check out my course Modify, which will go through every parameter for all the modifiers that you'll find under the Generate and Deform categories. You might be a little curious about the Geometry Nodes modifier as well. And while we won't cover Geometry Nodes in this basics course, Assemble by Jonathan Lampell goes into great detail. So check out Assemble if you're curious. OK, that just about covers it for modifiers. So when you're comfortable, let's go on to the next lesson. Mm -hmm.